Welcome to Whisperwood Stories. Today, we read a story from Genuinely Grim called Adopted. Let's begin. Part 1 I was born on the 17th of May, 1993, in a small town in Cornwall. Not that I would know, of course. That's just the date on my birth certificate. My twin sister, Drew and I, spent most of our childhood in and out of foster care. We never knew our biological parents, but the social workers always made sure that we were adopted together. By the time we were 13, we'd already had three adoptive families. We were used to homes having an expiration date, so when we were adopted by the Murphy family, Drew refused to unpack her suitcase for the better half of the month. It's not like we're going to be here very long anyway, she said one night. Mrs. Murphy is a piece of work. I couldn't argue with that. Out of the three adoptive families we'd previously had, this one seemed the least promising. Mrs. Murphy was an old-fashioned woman in her early fifties. She had a strict, no-nonsense attitude and was convinced that structure and discipline was exactly what children like us needed. Her husband was often away on business, so we had only seen him a handful of times. One good thing about being adopted by the Murphys was that I no longer had to go to school. I'd had severe troubles with it in the past, so Mrs. Murphy allowed me to be homeschooled on the condition that I take the work seriously. Drew, on the other hand, was happy to go to school and always returned with new stories to tell me. Melissa was making fun of me in the bathroom today, she said scornfully plopping down on my bed. So I tripped her up on her way to the chalkboard. I chuckled. Did you get in trouble? No, nope, no one saw. She smiled viciously. How's the homework going? It sucks, I admitted, scanning the algebra book strewn across the floor. Math is hard, and Mrs. Murphy expects me to do it myself. Huh, Drew said peering over my shoulder. Well, you can finish it later. Let's do something fun. Like what? Dunno. She blew a strand of hair out of her face. Wanna check out Mrs. Murphy's room? I felt intrigued. Mr. and Mrs. Murphy's bedroom was the only room we hadn't explored since our arrival. We had tried once, but were caught red-handed sneaking down the corridor. Mrs. Murphy was pretty irritated with us that time, and said that their bedroom was off-limits. Drew must have noticed my hesitation. She's downstairs making dinner, she said. She'll never know. Well, I suppose if we're quick about it, I shrugged. Great. Drew was already out the door, and I followed her, looking around warily. We tiptoed down the hallway and tried the handle. It was unlocked, and the door opened with a slight creak. It was a bedroom like any other. A double bed, a mahogany dresser, and a wardrobe. That was it. Drew wrinkled her nose, and I knew she wasn't satisfied. She marched over to the wardrobe and flung it open, scanning the contents. The dresser was next. Drew pulled each drawer open with a striking force, and I winced every time I thought I heard footsteps on the stairs. Drew, be quiet, she'll hear us, I hissed. But she took no notice. Looky here. She turned to me with a victorious smile. At first, I didn't know what I was looking at, 
The drawer was piled high with multicolored garments. Drew was particularly squealing with laughter by the time I noticed. Peeking out from under the sleeve of a red sweater was a small cylindrical object with a metallic base. Al and Drew. Mrs. Murphy called from downstairs. Dinner. I held my breath as Drew doubled over with laughter. Enough, let's go. I said, shutting the drawer and hurriedly pulling her towards the door. She was still giggling as we entered the kitchen. Drew, shut up, I said, blushing. Mrs. Murphy looked at us but said nothing. Did she know what we had done? How's the homework going? She asked as we sat down at the dinner table. It's all right, I lied. Drew was much better at math than I was. I knew she would help me finish the sums. Would you like to go to the cinema tomorrow? Mrs. Murphy said, stirring her soup. They're showing a new film about dinosaurs. But dinosaurs are so boring, Drew retorted. Why can't we see the alien movie instead? I don't like aliens, I said. Can't you go see it with someone from school? But I haven't made any friends yet, she pulled a face. All the kids are snobby and stuck up. Well, maybe if you wouldn't trip them, someone might actually want to be friends with you, I said. Drew stuck her tongue out at me. Listen, I think it's time we had a little chat, Mrs. Murphy said, nervously picking at the hem of her apron. Drew shot me an angry look. I knew I shouldn't have told on her. I don't know how things were in your previous homes, but in this family, we value honesty over pandering. Oh God, here we go, Drew sighed. I knew she was already thinking about where she put her suitcase. Now, I've tried to be patient, Mrs. Murphy began. I understand that your situation has been less than ideal, but this is your home now and I want to try and make things work. Drew kicked me under the table. Ow, Drew, stop! Listen to me. It's normal to have imaginary friends at a young age, but you're almost 14 now. Mrs. Murphy placed her hand gently on my shoulder. I gawked at her. I don't have any imaginary friends. Mrs. Murphy looked gravely uncomfortable. You must understand, she spoke softly. Drew isn't real. I looked at her, and then at Drew, sitting on the chair next to me. I wondered if perhaps Mrs. Murphy wasn't in her right mind. W what do you mean? She's my sister. You adopted us, you just, you called us both down for dinner. I noticed a glint of tears in her eyes. No, darling, I only called you. Your name is Alan Drew. Adopted, part two. I have never been very good at conveying my feelings, so describing the way I felt after Mrs. Murphy confronted me at the dinner table is virtually impossible. After she had told me that my own flesh and blood was a product of my imagination, my first thought was to contact my social worker and inform her that our new parent had meddled with her psych evaluation results. Drew had been with me since birth. We had taken our first steps together, gone to school together, and spent countless sleepless nights comforting each other and telling each other stories. After having my pride stripped away by the ward of the state, she was the only person I had left. How on earth was I supposed to make myself doubt her existence? 
That night, I'd left Mrs. Murphy crying at the kitchen table and returned to my room with a lump in my throat. I sat on my bed, attempting to picture my life from a different perspective. What if Mrs. Murphy was telling the truth? What if I was the crazy one? The thought sent ripples of pain through my body. Was that the reason my former families had given me up? A knock on the door interrupted my thoughts and made me jolt upright. Knock, knock. Drew was hovering in the doorway. May I come in? She had always been very brash, so it was unlike her to ask. I must have nodded because she crept into the room and perched on the edge of my bed. How are you feeling? She asked, clasping her hands together. I stared at her, at a loss for words. After hearing what Mrs. Murphy had said, I wasn't sure I was supposed to respond. Third time's the charm, they say. She tried again, her eyes twinkling callously. Who knew we'd end up with this lunatic? I sat still, studying my hands and twisting my fingers until my muscles ached. You don't actually believe her, do you? Her tone was suddenly sharp. Alan, she's raving mad. Anyone can see that. I looked at her, my eyes brimming with tears. There she was, with her chestnut hair tucked behind her ears, looking just as real as anyone else. I've been thinking, I began, gathering my courage and trying to maintain my composure. Of all the times you asked me to order for you at a restaurant, you said you were too shy. Was that a lie? She opened her mouth to speak, but I didn't wait for her to respond. Or that time I asked you to take the dog outside and he ran away? Alan... Drew shot me a warning look, but I took no notice. And what about the time you sang at the nativity play and no one clapped? Drew sat motionless. You don't believe me, she whispered. You don't believe I'm real. Tears rolled down my cheeks and dripped into my lap. No, I, I'm sorry, Drew. I don't. Drew showed up less and less after that. She had knocked on my door several times in an attempt to restore our relationship and make amends. But I had always blocked my ears and shut my eyes, telling her to go away until she did. I had opened up to Mrs. Murphy about my struggles and felt pleased to know that she wholeheartedly supported me. Before I knew it, I was all grown up and had found a place of my own. Mrs. Murphy had been kind enough to lend me some money to start me off, and it helped me move my things into an apartment on the other side of the city. The flat was spacious and airy, but significantly too large for a single college student. Two bedrooms and a dining room seemed like overkill, so I put up an ad online in search of a roommate. Soon enough, I had received several replies. I ended up choosing a student of a similar age to move into the bedroom adjacent to mine. His name was Luke. Luke was exceptionally social and frequently invited his friends over to hang out. I didn't mind, of course, as long as he gave me a heads up beforehand. He would always ask me to join them, but I never did. I preferred my own company and mostly kept to myself in my bedroom, playing video games and catching up on homework. One night, I woke up extremely thirsty and made my way to the kitchen to get a glass of water. As soon as I opened my bedroom door, however, I heard voices in the kitchen. I wondered if perhaps Luke had invited friends over and had forgotten to tell me. I remember thinking it strange. As it was a Wednesday night, and we both had lectures the following day. As I got close enough to discern the voices in the kitchen, 
I realized that Luke had a lady friend over, which was likely the reason he hadn't told me. I decided it was probably best not to disturb them, and had a drink from the bathroom sink before heading back to bed. The following morning, I woke up early and went to the kitchen. Luke was already there, sitting at the table and reading the newspaper as he usually did. Good morning, I said. How was your date? I had meant this in a joking way, of course, but Luke looked up at me dumbfounded. What date? He demanded, biting into his toast. Don't play dumb, I scoffed, opening the fridge. I heard you two talking last night. There was a moment of silence. Oh, that, he said. I don't believe you're in a position to be asking questions. I looked at him, taken aback. What was all I could manage? Well, how come you didn't tell me? His tone was confrontational, and in spite of myself, I felt my skin prickling. To tell you what? I asked. He looked at me incredulously. That your sister moved in. Adopted. Part 3. What do you mean my sister moved in? I stared at Luke, feeling the blood draining from my face. He looked at me with concern. Are you okay, Alan? You look like you've seen a ghost. I felt like it too. Thoughts whirled in my mind and refused to make sense. I grabbed the edge of the table for support and repeated my question through gritted teeth. Well, I found her in the kitchen last night after I came in to get my vitamins. He said, studying my reaction. She said her name was Drew and she'll be staying with us for a while. I assumed you already knew. I slumped down into the wooden chair and buried my face in my hands. Alan, what's wrong? He sounded alarmed. She is your sister, right? My mouth felt dry as a cotton ball. So, y you can see her too? I asked. Luke stared at me, perplexed. Why wouldn't I be able to see her? Because, I began, but then reconsidered. I didn't want Luke to think I was crazy. I didn't know him that well, so I couldn't anticipate his reaction. He didn't even know that I had been adopted. Because... He raised his eyebrows curiously. It's nothing, I said hurriedly, getting up from the table. Where is she? Drew? Luke's eyes looked like saucers. She said she'll be staying on the couch in the living room. Apprehension flooded over me. What was the meaning of this? Had Mrs. Murphy been lying to me all these years? Luke had spoken about Drew as though she was a living, breathing being. So that meant she had to be the real deal, right? Hiya, a familiar voice said as I peeped through the living room door. You can come in. Drew was sitting cross-legged on the couch and mashing the buttons on the remote control. I should think so, I retorted. It is my living room. We stared at the TV screen in silence. What are you doing here, Drew? I finally asked. She looked wounded. What's that supposed to mean? She cried, pulling her knees to her chest. I haven't seen you in years. We've been over this, I said sternly. I just want a normal life. Is that what this is? She sniffled. You even got a new roommate. I couldn't help myself. How come he can see you? I blurted out. I told you, Al. Mrs. Murphy has a screw loose. She ripped us apart, filling your head with 
all that rubbish. I didn't answer. Mrs. Murphy had been very patient, generous with me. I felt forever in her debt. Well, you can't stay here, I told her. I knew Drew's short temper only too well, but I wasn't going to be swayed this time. It's only for a little while, she pleaded. You can't throw me out. I returned to my room with a lump in my throat. It had been years since I'd last seen Drew, and here she was, watching TV in my living room as if nothing had ever happened. With shaky fingers, I picked up my phone and dialed the only number I knew by heart. Hello. Mrs. Murphy's voice came through the line. Alan. Yes, it's me, I assured her. I have s I have to ask you something. What is it? I took a deep breath. Is Drew real? I shut my eyes anticipating the response. Mrs. Murphy was silent. For a moment, I wondered if we had been disconnected. What's wrong, Alan? There was an edge to her voice. I... Can you just answer my question? I feel droplets of sweat forming on my upper lip. She sighed. Darling, you know Drew is your middle name. What's happened? I summarized the morning's events as best I could, stumbling over my words and gesturing wildly with my arms. Luke told me this morning, I said, and he can see her too. Mrs. Murphy hesitated. Perhaps I could come see you tomorrow afternoon, she said. We could talk more about it then. I nodded into the receiver. You can, but Luke will probably be having one of his weekly get-togethers in the evening. That's all right, she said. I'll just drop by. Mrs. Murphy arrived at about 6 p.m. the following evening. I had warned Luke and his buddies not to get too rowdy, as I didn't want her getting the wrong impression. He had agreed and ushered all of his friends into the kitchen, letting us have some privacy. Drew had refused to leave, however, and loitered in the living room. So I led Mrs. Murphy into my bedroom, shutting the door behind us. How are you feeling? Mrs. Murphy asked as soon as we sat down. I'm all right, I said, as a muffled pop came from the kitchen followed by a subdued cheer. Sorry about the noise. Luke's having a party. Mrs. Murphy nodded studying me carefully. Luke is the roommate you told me about? She asked. Yeah, I said, fiddling with my pocket zipper. He moved in about a month ago. Mrs. Murphy took a deep breath. Listen, Alan. The reason I came over is to check if you're okay, she said. You sounded awfully distraught over the phone. I stared at her, unsure of what to say. Have you been taking your medication? Her tone was serious. I winced. There was a long, tense silence. I haven't, I admitted. Mrs. Murphy's face fell. But everything was fine up until yesterday, I promise, I said, trying to salvage the situation. This was the first time I had seen Drew in years. I heard the kitchen door open, and the shuffle of feet in the hallway. A knock on my bedroom door signaled that the kitchen was no longer occupied. It's alright, they're just leaving, I chuckled, but Mrs. Murphy looked paler than ever. Alan, she whispered. W what's the matter? I said, a chill crawling up my spine. Her eyes were brimming with tears as she reached for her phone. There's nobody here.
adopted finale. I felt like I had been punched in the stomach. Despite chills running through my body, sweat was pooling under my arms as I gawked at Mrs. Murphy, bewildered. This couldn't be happening, I thought. Not again. My mind had betrayed me so many times before, I felt like a lunatic. I leaned against Mrs. Murphy's chest, sobbing heartily. She rocked me back and forth. What's wrong with me? I cried, dabbing my sleeve over my blotched face. Nothing is wrong with you, darling. Her voice was soft and soothing. You just need to take your medication. I squinted through my tears to see the bottle of pills sitting on the bedside table. You mean, neither Drew nor Luke is... I couldn't say the word. She rubbed my arm reassuringly and nodded. This is your apartment, she affirmed, reaching for the bottle of pills and shaking one to her palm. Here, take this. You'll feel better. I swallowed the pill and sank onto my pillow, overwhelmed by the day's events. I couldn't wrap my mind around Mrs. Murphy's words. My whole existence seemed to be in question. And I was afraid that soon, I wouldn't be able to discern my reality from the truth. Mrs. Murphy... I said, staring up at the ceiling. Yes, Alan. She turned her head to look at me. Well, I have to be... I swallowed. Admit it. She hesitated. No, I shouldn't think so. She tried to sound positive. As long as you take your medication. I nodded, drawing my gaze back to the ceiling. I'd have to take it. My reality had become too dangerous, my senses completely unreliable. I couldn't run the risk of making a fool of myself in public, or worse, getting detained for my psychotic behavior. It's time for me to go now, Alan, Mrs. Murphy said, gathering her belongings and making her way towards the door. Get some rest. Thank you, I whispered, for coming. Her eyes were filled with sympathy. I'll call you tomorrow, she said, closing the bedroom door. I laid in bed, mentally categorizing the events of the past week, month, year. I felt like a character in a movie. Everything I knew was a simulation. My roommate, my friends, and even my sister were nothing more than animated puppets in my mind, meddling with my reality and life as I knew it. As I heard Mrs. Murphy close the front door, I remembered that Drew was still in the living room. One way or another, I had to get rid of her. With heavy steps, I made my way there praying silently that the medication had already taken effect and I wouldn't find her. I opened the door and scanned the room. It was empty. No sign of Drew. I heaved a sigh of relief and leaned against my door frame. Mrs. Murphy had been right. What on earth had I been thinking? Not taking the medicine. I clearly needed it. I felt a wave of calmness wash over me. I was going to get better. I was going to survive this. Just like I had survived that fateful day years ago. When I found out, my sister wasn't real. Voices outside the living room window caught my attention. My apartment was on the first floor, so I could easily hear the noises coming from the street. I walked over to the window and looked outside. The tree was blocking my view, but I could see a group of people standing behind it. 
cracked the window open and leaned silently to the left. My heart sank. It was Mrs. Murphy. She was rummaging through her purse, frantically searching for something. Standing nonchalantly in a half circle beside her were Drew and Luke. I swear I had it with me. Mrs. Murphy sounded panic-stricken. Drew was tapping her foot on the pavement. We don't really care, we just want our cut, she said. I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. There they were, the people closest to me, all together, all talking as though they didn't have a care in the world. You'll get your cut. Mrs. Murphy was irate now, placing the contents of her purse in a neat pile on the sidewalk. I must have left it inside. What? What were they talking about? I felt faint. Well, go back and get it then, Lou retorted. We don't have all day. Alarm bells went off in my mind. Mrs. Murphy was about to come back into my apartment to retrieve something she had apparently left behind. I shut the window, bolted back to my room, looking around desperately for anything out of place. Nothing caught my eye at first and I panicked, picturing Mrs. Murphy climbing up the stairs, about to let herself into the door any second. Then I saw it. A black, rectangular box peeking out from a couple of photo albums. On closer inspection, I realized that it was a small camcorder. I grabbed it off the shelf and stuffed it inside my sweatshirt pocket. Just as the front door flung open, and Mrs. Murphy barged in. She was out of breath and red in the face, which got even redder as she saw me watching her from the center of my room. Alan, she cried. I thought you'd be asleep. I said nothing. Are you all right, dear? She said, her eyes drifting towards the bookshelf. She exhaled sharply. She noticed the camcorder was missing. Alan, was there a... a camera? I said, pulling it out of my pocket. She tensed up, a vein appearing in her forehead. Alan, give that to me, she said. She kept her voice low, despite the hue of her face. No, I waved it at her. Why don't we watch it together? I took several steps backwards to my desk, not wanting to turn my back on her. I knew I could easily overpower her if it came to that. Alan, please, she said. Let me explain. I stared at her silently. She dropped her purse, put her hands on her chest. We were very poor when we adopted you and Drew. She began, tears welling up in her eyes. We struggled to make ends meet. I watched her dispassionately. My husband, Mr. Murphy, found a doctor who offered us monthly payments in exchange for... She sobbed. For testing an experimental medication. I felt dread creeping up my spine, but said nothing. They were particularly interested in sets of twins. She sounded almost apologetic. I thought it would benefit all of us. All of us? I repeated the word slowly. Yes, she nodded. Drew wasn't supposed to know, but she heard me discussing it with Dr. Morgan over the phone and demanded a share of the money. That's how we came up with this arrangement. We needed to find a way of keeping you on the pills. When Luke told me you haven't been taking them, I sent Drew over to fight for our cause. I swallowed. Is that why she came here? I said, 
to convince me I was sick. Mrs. Murphy flushed. The experiment went on longer than we had expected, she said. Dr. Morgan said the medication might have lasting effects. What, what do the pills do? Mrs. Murphy winced. You mustn't stop taking them, Alan. What do they do? I demanded, staring her dead in the eye. She sighed. They maintain a, a balance in your brain. She said, wringing her hands nervously. I broke out in a cold sweat. Which means? Mrs. Murphy took a few steps back. They keep you from going crazy, she whispered. Thank you for listening to Whisperwood Stories. If you enjoyed, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe down below. Do you have a story that you'd like me to read here? Consider commenting or sending it to whisperwoodsubmissions gmail.com. The story in this video was read with the author's permission. Thank you again for listening, and be sure to check out the original Rena posts. Don't let the shadows get too close.